So it's going to be a um, short presentation. Uh, my goal is a little bit to uh, follow up. I was discussing this uh, with Audrey uh, about the um, Suboxone induction and merge. And um, um, it's a little bit of a follow up about uh, my grant round that I presented uh, last uh, spring, uh, February, I think. So last winter, I guess, before COVID. Um, so for those um, who were there are going to kind of like know a little bit the introduction for the other. Um, while you all know that the opioid crisis is a big uh, problem um, all over the world, but uh, in Canada as well. And um, just you know, as a little uh, uh, heads up, it's not getting better with COVID um, for multiple reasons. Uh, but um, there's worse quality of the drug uh, in the street because of the closure of the, the, the borders. There's a increase in like uh, distress and mental health and um, people being lonely when they take a drug or just being lonely all the time uh, makes uh, mental health uh, worse. So there's been a number of uh, provinces, uh, an increased number in death and um, <clears throat> overdose um, by uh, opioids. Um, so recently, I don't know for those uh, who are aware about this, but the CAPE, uh, uh, the latest um, position statement from uh, CAPE uh, is about opioid uh, use and disorder um, and its uh, management in the emergency uh, department. So I would certainly encourage you to uh, all go uh, read it and um, especially R5, maybe there's gonna be some question in the exam, uh, who knows. Uh, so just uh, specifically about uh, buprenorphine and, and naloxone. So CAPE is uh, advocating uh, that we do start uh, buprenorphine and naloxone uh, initiation, initiation uh, in the emergency department Department. And uh, this can be uh, done within the ED or to um, be set up as a own induction as well uh, when, when the setup is there. Uh, they also state that we should be familiar with other forms of uh, opioid agonist therapy, such as methadone or uh, sustained uh, release uh, oral morphine. And um, we should uh, be treating withdrawal aggressively in the emergency uh, department. And compassionately as well. Um, so yeah, so this is just a little bit of a, a like or like uh, association is supporting this. So I think uh, we should uh, all learn a little bit more about it and to be implementing that in our clinical practice to help people that are uh, struggling with the opioid use disorder. Um, so just as a, uh, this is directly from my presentation in the spring, but just uh, to remind you the risk factor for that when you have an opioid use disorder, while well, concomitant uh, mental health issue, uh, decreased drug tolerance, and this I'm, I'm gonna insist a little bit on this one. Uh, mainly uh, if someone stops uh, taking an uh, opioid for, for a while because they're trying to stop and uh, unfortunately they have a relapse because we know it's very difficult and if they relapse to the same dose that they used to uh, take before, uh, well you can't lose the tolerance during that abstinence uh, period so uh, you're more at risk of uh, doing um, respiratory depression leading to death. Uh, being alone, obviously, if you're uh, alone taking your opioid, uh, more likely to, de uh, to die. Lack of social support and a lack of a comprehensive uh, and uh, coordinated uh, healthcare system. So I think this is a part where we, uh, as an emergency physician, can intervene. Um, just also to remind you that the tolerance uh, to the analgesia and uh, euphoric effect is not the same as the respiratory depression. And the more you get tolerant, the, the less of a difference between those two effects uh, there is. Uh, so the more likely you, you get to uh, uh, have a fat fatal uh, overdose. So just a little case uh, to um, put you in the mood. So let's say you have a 55 years old uh, female, she's on welfare, but she looks uh, more, uh, way, way older than that. And she's coming for a classic acute on chronic back pain. So you start uh, asking her a little bit more question and uh, she's been uh, followed uh, after work accident that was very long time ago. Uh, she's been on chronic opioid uh, regularly. She often runs out of her medication. She's like, unable to see her GP at the moment. So that's why she comes to the emergency department. And in front of you, she's obviously sweating. 
and she has tremors, she's restless on the stretcher, she looks, she's nauseous and she has abdominal cramp. Um, so she's obviously in withdrawal. And when you ask her a little bit more about this, uh, she tells you that she often runs out of uh, medication, that she needs to buy it on the street, and that she's often not able to buy her own food or to pay her rent because of this. So she's really struggling with this, uh, this problem. So she clearly has an addiction. Just as a little reminder of all the uh, symptoms that you can see in the opioid uh, withdrawal, this is a pretty visual. Uh, but other than that, you, we can use more uh, systematic uh, tool. And um, I think we're all familiar now with the CWA score for alcohol withdrawal. Well, the COW score is a little bit the same. Uh, you can find it in your favorite uh, uh, app, uh, calculator, or even on the internet. Uh, hopefully one day we can maybe integrate that uh, in Medzur the same way we have the, the, the um, uh, CWA protocol. So it's based on 11 criteria and you, uh, it works exactly the same and it's going to give you um, a score um, that kind of like correlates with the severity of uh, withdrawal. So a mild score uh, would be 5 to 12, moderate score would be 13 to um, 24, and more than 24, 25 would be a severe. So there's different ways to treat withdrawal in the emergency department. So you could go with something that has an opioid property. You could obviously give them like short acting morphine and treat uh, their symptoms uh, by replacing the opioids that they're not taking. Uh, but there's also other way to treat it. and. Um, uh, methadone, which is a long acting, or even buprenorphine, or gonna have an effect on treating the symptoms. But as adjuncts, you could also use um, medication that would mainly treat the symptoms and not the withdrawal, um, like if I can say physiopathology in itself. Uh, so clonidine, uh, hydro, um, hydrolazine, I think there's a mistake there, uh, Benadryl, um, and Zofran, uh, Loperamide, and uh, obviously uh, kind of like pain medication because uh, um, patients uh, going into withdrawal are often complaining a lot of, uh, about pain. Uh, when we're talking about methadone, I'm not going to go very uh, in-depth about this, but I don't think there's uh, any role in the emergency for initiation of, uh, of methadone. It would be okay to prescribe uh, methadone if patients have been missing a few doses or at least one dose, uh, not uh, to be done if it's been like more uh, three doses or more. And um, that's all I'm going to say about methadone. So buprenorphine, um, and it is mixed with naloxone and it's called uh, Suboxone, the trade uh, trademark, uh, has been shown to decrease mortality, to improve uh, withdrawal symptoms, to decrease the uh, drug use and to improve uh, follow-up rates and also even to decrease crime uh, rate associated with it. It has multiple advantages compared to methadone and uh, mainly it's rapid to initiate and to find your uh, dosing. There's less sleepiness associating, associated with it. Uh, it lasts um, um, uh, longer and um, some people find the withdrawal maybe easier and there's also uh, i think what is very important uh, to realize a reduced risk of uh, overdose compared uh, to methadone um however it's a little bit more uh, expensive um and if it's used uh, not correctly and we'll get back to this but it can precipitate uh, withdrawal that would make a very bad experience for the patient and me uh, kind of like a break uh, uh, or um, prevent patient from trying it uh, further or going uh, all the way until the end of the induction. So I mean, there's multiple ways to do this and uh, I've done it like a few times. I cannot say I'm an expert, but uh, the protocol I've been using and there's multiple of them on the internet is the one uh, that is on uh, EM cases, uh, episode 116. And this is a, a graph directly from uh, their podcast. If you have like ever encounter a situation, I would just suggest you Google this uh, on the uh, 
uh, and uh, you're going to find the protocol and it's very uh, easy to use. So buprenorphine is a partial uh, opioid agonist. Uh, it's, it binds very strongly to the receptor, but it only gives a partial uh, activity. And this is also why it's going to precipitate withdrawal. If you still have some, a lot of um, opioid in your blood, well, because it's very strong affinity, it's going to push all the opioid that are currently attached, and this is going to cause the withdrawal and the precipitation of withdrawal. It also has um, naloxone uh, mixed to it, uh, but when you're taking it as uh, sublingual, uh, it doesn't get absorbed or it doesn't have any effect. It's mainly to prevent um, crushing the pill and injecting it uh, IV. So it's to prevent the diversion of the medication. So it's a sublingual um, administration. And if we look a little bit more carefully at the protocol, um, this is, uh, I just put it bigger for you. Uh, so mainly you should be um, looking at, to confirm that your patient has an uh, opioid use disorder and you can refer to the DSM uh, to make sure of this. You should be in talking with your patient, make sure they're consenting to this, that they are like interested in stopping or well, I should say, in uh, replacement therapy, and that they're also aware of um, the potential uh, risk associated with it. And like, especially um, what we were discussing, the de decrease of the tolerance, and like you should be counseling about um, uh, what happened if they relapse, reducing the dose um, of this. Then, um, because we were saying it can precipitate withdrawal, you have to make sure that your patient is in withdrawal in front of you. So this suggests a cow score uh, above 12 that you can measure uh, with the uh, objective scale. And also a time uh, since last opioid of either 16, 24 hours depending of, or 72 hours depending of um, the, the half-life of the, the medication that the, or the drug that the patient was uh, abusing. Uh, you should uh, be looking for any contraindication that those would be allergy, hepatic dysfunction. Um, another, uh, but well, two very important um, um, contraindication or uh, concomitant or concurrent um, alcohol use disorder or benzo use disorder because it can kind of like uh, potentiate the, the respiratory depression and give side effects like that. So uh, you have to make sure that your patient uh, don't have this. So once you've like checked all this, then you can start with your uh, induction and they suggest giving two or four milligrams sublingual every hour until you can control your symptom. Um, uh, up to a maximum of 12 milligram on the first day. I did it a few weeks ago uh, with a patient that was very symptomatic, um, two milligrams at the time uh, for uh, every hour. Um, it was at the MGH uh, a few months ago. And it takes six hours before you can control the symptoms. So um, it was one of the, like, it was the first time I was uh, doing it. So I was kind of like a little bit careful about it. And uh, in retrospect, I, I think I would have gone a little bit faster, like maybe four milligram initially, uh, and then uh, another four milligram, and then maybe two and two to uh, get to the 12 milligram because the patient was very uncomfortable for a long period of time, uh, despite me trying to give uh, uh, Tylenol, NSAIDs, and uh, Zofran and other medication to help with her symptoms. Uh, so this is the protocol. It's very easy to, to use if you're going to use it. Just like uh, Google it, uh, open it, uh, go like over it very quickly before just to review, to refresh your mind. Uh, but it's very useful um, uh, and very easy to do. Um, there's other, this is just an example. There's other protocols that are available uh, on the internet. Um, those, uh, this is from Yale's uh, university, they use four or four and they go to a maximum of eight milligram on the first day. So there's different way of doing it. And there's also uh, what is uh, uh, more and more interesting, and I'm not talking about this really today, but uh, home, home induction is also recommended by a lot of uh, uh, specialists in, uh, in the field. And there is also evidence that is safe to do. So basically you're giving a, kind of like a protocol sheet to the patient. You have to have a patient that, call, uh, call, uh, that um, 
cooperative uh, with you and that is interested and that has enough uh, like resources to be able to to go through this uh, but basically they go with a protocol and they're going to do their uh, induction at home um, and do their titration to uh, to their DAWs uh, by themselves uh, so this is just an example from the uh, Ministry of British Columbia that is pu publishing a protocol for home induction uh, for patient uh, to do that at home uh, so if you're going to do that, I think it's very important to be very uh, non-judgmental. I think it, what I, one thing I've been struggling a lot, um, uh, I mean, it's been, it was at the MGH, but it, it can be other places. Uh, it's just like all the medical personnel, if we kind of like uh, have a tendency, oh, another like uh, another like addict junkie uh whatever uh they're never gonna get it uh over it like why are you trying to help them let's just try to kick them out of the emerge as soon as possible and i think it's uh, very sad to see that uh, among uh, healthcare professional uh, i think we see it and hopefully uh if you are all kind of like involved in this we can kind of like um make people a bit more aware and show that there's potential to help uh, uh, those people it's also very important to uh, discuss about the overdose uh, and educate your patient about this and uh, we should be ideally and uh, giving naloxone to patient uh, i was discussing that with the uh, epic uh, the pharmacist is not possible at the moment because uh, for multiple reasons it's free in, in uh, uh, community pharmacy but like the hospital would have to pay for it uh, so it's a little bit um, unfortunate maybe eventually we can find a solution and if you work in a, a, another center one one day maybe you can uh, like work on having a few of those like naloxone kit in your eMERGE so when you discharge a patient directly from the eMERGE they leave with this and they don't need to go to the pharmacy. Uh, the other uh, struggle with uh, doing a, a home, uh, like an, a Suboxone induction is referral it's very difficult uh, i mean in like in quebec in general but to have uh, to ensure proper follow-up uh, for those patients and like especially from emerge we're always a little bit struggling where do i send the patient in a like timely fashion and um, there's the comp that can be a very good resources patient needs to uh, call by themselves and um, but those people are kind of like helping the people that don't have any other resources so basically if a patient has a family doctor that would be the best uh, resources for the patient so like call your family doctor tomorrow and uh, make an uh, appointment as soon as possible. Uh, if they don't have a family doctor or uh, it's totally impossible to, to see the family doctor, well, you can refer them to the car. You can, um, there's also the Ertzel uh, Clinic at the Jewett as a, um, opioid uh, program now. And um, there's also other resources you can, talk to your detox uh, team as well uh, for example at the MGH that are a little bit maybe um, uh, that know a little bit more the resources uh, on the field uh, but I would say the con would be a good uh, place to start uh, for patients that don't have any follow-up. Um, so this is just a list of uh, other resources that I can send you the presentation but uh, basically if you type uh, Quebec uh, 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 Suboxone, there's a lot of resources. This is uh, BC uh, uh, Ministry of Health has a lot of uh, good information. The S NSPQ, ENSPQ has a training in Quebec for physician and other healthcare professional as well to um, kind of like how to, uh, well, a, a lot of information on how to do this and uh, way longer than my 15 minute talk this morning. Uh, but this is a good resource that I think those for, uh, training are in French, unfortunately. Um, but uh, other provinces have a, a lot of uh, good resources. So uh, I think that my talk is already over. That was very quick. That was a very uh, short uh, presentation, but my goal is mainly to make you a little bit more aware of this and to uh, like remember the EM cases episode 116 is a very good resources if you're going to do that. And uh, just uh, so everybody is aware, at the MGH and RBH, we now have uh, Suboxone uh, in the emergency department. It used to be very complicated, but I've worked with, uh, we work with uh, uh, PO and uh, Eric to bring this available in the Pixis. So uh, both sides have uh, Suboxone and Emerge if you want to do it. Is there any question?